Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today we wind up our look at pop culture in the year 1933 before returning to Beach Boy content next week. Covering any year, particularly one as eventful as 1933 and only two episodes is daunting, so let's get started right away with a look at radio. Radio was growing by leaps and bounds in the early 30s. Home ownership of radios had grown by more than 10% in 1932 alone. And sets were getting cheaper, especially the new tabletop models. The most attractive thing about radio, and something that seemed almost unbelievable at the time, was once you bought the set, all the entertainment was free. You just had to listen to some advertising. And you could do it at home without the trouble and expense of going out. It was a great value, especially with the Depression on. At mid-year, the top-rated programs of the 1932-1933 radio season were, at number one, The Eddie Cantor Show, sponsored by Chase and Sanborn Coffee, Sundays on NBC. It was the most popular program on radio by a significant distance. Cantor was not only the biggest star on radio, but also a reliable hit comedy film star as well. At number two was Edwin's Texaco Fire Chief, sponsored by Texaco, Tuesdays on NBC. With his wild look and his crazy voice, <laughs> Edwin was more of a clown than a comedian. At number three was Jack Pearl's Baron Munchausen, sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes, Thursdays on NBC. Pearl's shtick was to tell tall tales in character as Baron Munchausen to his straight man, Charlie. When Charlie didn't believe him, he would respond with the famous catchphrase, Was you there, Charlie? It was a huge hit in 1933. There will even be a movie, Meet the Baron, with Pearl in the title role, released in the fall. Comedy support in the picture will come from Jimmy Durante, Zazu Pitts, and Ted Healy and his Stooges. In fourth place was the Lucky Strike Hour, sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. It was hosted by comedian monologist Walter O'Keefe. It ran Tuesdays on NBC after Ed Wynn. At number five was the Maxwell House Showboat, sponsored by Maxwell House Coffee, Thursdays on NBC ahead of Jack Pearl. At number six was the Rudy Valley Show, sponsored by Fleischmann's Yeast. It led into the Maxwell House Show Thursday nights on NBC. At number seven was Amos and Andy, sponsored by Pepsodent Toothpaste. It ran Monday through Friday in the early evening on the Blue One Network. The series started in 1928 and will remain immensely popular, even running on television with a different cast, naturally, in the early 50s. To say it hasn't aged well would be a major understatement. At number eight was the Al Jolson Show for Chevrolet. In November 1932, Al Jolson began a limited 15-week radio show, Friday nights on NBC. It served as advanced promotion for his upcoming movie, Hallelujah, I'm a Bum, which we discussed in part one. Of course, Jolson had spoken the first lines in what was widely considered the first talking picture, The Jazz Singer, in 1927. Jolson had been a huge recording star in the 19-teens and the 1920s. By the early 30s, his recording career was fading out, replaced by a new wave of more intimate-sounding crooners like Bing Crosby. Jolson was, however, a household name and considered showbiz royalty, so having him appear on his own limited radio series was a big draw. At number nine was Lucky Strike Dance Band, sponsored once again by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. It was on NBC Saturday nights and was the only all-music program in the top ten. And rounding out the top ten was the Guy Lombardo Show featuring Burns and Allen, sponsored by Robert Burns Cigars. It ran Wednesdays on CBS. Burns and Allen, who were married in real life, had only joined the Lombardo show this season, and already it was George and Gracie's hilarious patter that most listeners were tuning in for. On the show, they had regularly talked about ditzy Gracie's equally ditzy brother, a guy who did things like invent an umbrella with holes in it so you could tell when the rain stopped. The brother was referred to, but never actually appeared on the show. On the January 4th, 1933 episode, Gracie reported that her mythical brother was missing. After that, Gracie would turn up unannounced on other shows, looking for her brother and doing short comedy routines. She even turned up on shows on other networks. The stunt was a huge hit with the public, 
and one of the first national crazes of this type. Decades before Who Shot JR, everybody was joking about where Gracie's missing brother was. The missing brother gag helped Burns and Allen's ratings jump by 32% from December 1932 to January 1933 and put their program with Guy Lombardo into the top 10. Other popular shows that finished out of the top 10 included The Ben Burney Show, Mert and Marge, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, The Marx Brothers Program, Flywheel, Shyster, and Flywheel, which ended its run in May, Bing Crosby, Music That Satisfies, and The Jack Benny Program. In addition to radio, most homes were still getting their news and increasingly their entertainment through newspapers. Many homes had delivery of a morning and an evening paper. Faced with increased competition from radio, newspapers were stepping up the entertainment content in the early 30s. Papers had been running syndicated comic strips for years. Now many papers had an entire Sunday supplement dedicated to the funnies. Comics were mostly aimed at kids, but adults were reading them too. Some of the most popular comic strips in 1933 were Thimble Theater featuring Popeye the Sailor, Mickey Mouse, Dick Tracy, Gasoline Alley, and Fritzy Ritz. Not surprisingly, there was a lot of crossover with comic strips being adapted to radio and movies and movie and radio characters being adapted for the comics. One of the most popular comic strips was Little Orphan Annie. By 1933, the strip had been adapted to radio and film and was something of a craze. As with many of the most popular strips, there was a lot of merchandising. In 1933 alone, you could get Little Orphan Annie books, dolls, mugs, a special shake-up mug for mixing Ovaltine, which was the sponsor of the Little Orphan Annie radio show, and a board game, which was also full of Ovaltine advertising. Some popular new cartoon characters introduced in the year were Nancy in Ernie Bushmiller's Fritzy Ritz and Dippy Dog, eventually renamed Goofy in Mickey Mouse, both in January. On February 17th, Dagwood Bumstead makes his first appearance in the Blondie cartoon strip, and in July, Sweet Pea joins the cast of Popeye in Thimble Theater. In April, Eastern Color Printing publishes a collection of cartoons from the Sunday newspaper featuring popular favorites like Joe Palooka, Mutt and Jeff, The Bungle Family, Regular Fellers, and Keeping Up with the Joneses. Simply titled Funnies on Parade, it'll sell well and show publishers that there's a market for books of comics. In addition to the comics, there was, of course, still plenty of news in those newspapers in the second half of 1933. On September 26th, George Machine Gun Kelly is arrested for the brazen kidnapping for ransom of wealthy Oklahoma City resident Charles F. Urschel in July. The news of Kelly's arrest is overshadowed in the media by the escape of 10 inmates, including all members of the future John Dillinger gang from a Michigan City, Indiana prison on the same night. In 1933, newspapers eagerly reported the exploits of the most colorful bank robbers and gangsters. It sold papers. It also created a mystique and began turning some of them into folk heroes. Much of the public had little sympathy for banks who, they felt, had gambled away their depositors' savings in the stock market and then, having lost, were kicking families off their homes and farms by foreclosing on their mortgages. Prohibition laws, which were widely skirted and ignored by corrupt police, had bred contempt for the law itself, and some of the gangsters, like Babyface Nelson, had learned criminal skills in bootlegging early in their careers. People marveled at the daring exploits in the newspapers, and some of the criminals began to use their celebrity and public sympathy to help them avoid capture. Fast cars also made it easy to escape pursuing police by crossing state lines, and the need for new law enforcement with interstate authority will lead to the rise of the FBI. Machine Gun Kelly was the first of the big-name criminals to be taken in, and, as it would turn out, the only one ultimately taken alive. In 1934, Bonnie and Clyde, John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Babyface Nelson will all be gunned down by law enforcement. Ma Barker will be gunned down along with her son Fred in a shootout with FBI agents in January 1935. On November 12th, the Chicago World's Fair closes for the year, having received over 22 million visitors since it opened in May. Subtitled A Century of Progress, 
It highlighted advances in science and technology and was a hopeful sign for the depression-strapped country. The fair was so successful that its run had been extended for an additional 11 days and it was set to reopen on June 1, 1934 for another summer. And on December 5th, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution repeals the 18th Amendment, fully ending prohibition in the United States after 14 years. And what were the hit records in the second half of 1933? Reaching number three on July 1st was Isn't It Heavenly by Eddie Dutcham. The Shadow Waltz from the movie Gold Diggers of 1933 was yet another hit for red hot singing star Bing Crosby. It'll go to number one for two weeks beginning July 8th. Eddie Dutchman's recording of I Cover the Waterfront hit number three for two weeks beginning July 15th. And Lazy Bones by Ted Lewis went to number one for four weeks beginning July 22nd. It was written by Johnny Mercer and Hoagie Carmichael. Bing Crosby had a number three hit with Learn to Croon from his new movie College Humor on July 29th. Duke Ellington's Sophisticated Lady went to number three on August 12th. And Love is the Sweetest Thing by Al Noble went to number one for five weeks beginning August 19th. Bing Crosby's My Love hit number four on August 19th. And The Last Roundup by George Olson will go to number one for nine weeks beginning September 23rd, making it the biggest record of the year. Thanks by Bing Crosby from another new movie, Too Much Harmony, will hit number two for two weeks beginning September 30th. Don Bester's version of The Last Roundup will go to number two for two weeks beginning October 14th. And Victor Young's recording of Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf from Disney's Three Little Pigs will go to number three on October 14th. Coming out of a Disney cartoon, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf was an unexpected popular favorite in 1933. Its confident refrain was widely seen as a call to carry on bravely in the face of the Depression. Don Bester's version of Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf will go to number two on October 25th, and Bing Crosby's version of The Last Roundup will go to number two on October 28th. Guy Lombardo will have a hit with The Last Roundup as well. It'll go to number one for three weeks beginning November 4th. Bing Crosby's The Day You Came Along will go to number three on November 11th. Victor Young's version of The Last Roundup will go to number three on December 2nd. The B-side to Guy Lombardo's The Last Roundup, Annie Doesn't Live Here Anymore, will go to number two for two weeks beginning December 9th. And Leo Reisman's Yesterdays will go to number three on December 9th. Eddie Dutchin's Did You Ever See a Dream Walking will hit number one for three weeks beginning December 16th. And Guy Lombardo's version of Did You Ever See a Dream Walking will go to number two for two weeks beginning December 23rd. Of course, there were also a lot of big new movie releases in the second half of 1933. Released on July 5th was College Humor, starring singing sensation Bing Crosby with Jack Oakey, Richard Arlen, and Burns and Allen. On July 20th came Universal's mysterious Secret of the Blue Room, starring Lionel Atwill and Gloria Stewart. Released on August 4th was Tugboat Annie, starring Marie Dressler and Wallace Beery. They were both compelling performers and were hugely popular in the early 30s. In fact, according to a theater exhibitors poll, Wallace Beery was the fifth biggest box office draw of 1933 and Marie Dressler was number one. It's kind of hard to imagine either one of them having the look to be a movie star today. On August 17th came The Private Life of Henry VIII, for which Charles Lawton will earn an Oscar for Best Actor. Released one day later on the 18th was Morning Glory, for which Katharine Hepburn will win an Oscar for Best Actress. Released on August 29th was Dinner at Eight, a comedy drama with an all-star cast headed by Marie Dressler, John Barrymore, Wallace Beery, Jean Harlow, and Lionel Barrymore. It was directed by George Cukor. On October 6th came I'm No Angel, starring Mae West and, once again, co-starring up-and-coming actor Cary Grant. As usual, Mae West's character is bawdy and suggestive. In this same month, October, when the National Legion of Decency is formed to clean up Hollywood, they will specifically cite Mae West as one of the reasons for their formation. Like her last picture, this one will also be a box office smash. Released on October 21st, James K. 
Cagney and Joan Blondell in the musical comedy Footlight Parade. On November 13th, from Universal Pictures came The Invisible Man. Like King Kong earlier in the year, it pushed the boundaries of visual effects. It was written as a vehicle for Boris Karloff, who had walked out on Universal in a salary dispute. He was replaced by Claude Rains in his first film role. His voice was great for the part, which was the main concern since he only appeared for a moment at the end of the film as his character dies. On November 16th came Katharine Hepburn in a film adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. Released on November 17th was Duck Soup, starring the Marx Brothers. Their last picture, Horse Feathers, was so popular that it landed them on the cover of Time magazine. There were high hopes for the follow-up. Some critics complained that the brothers were taking themselves too seriously by including an anti-war message, saying audiences just wanted pure escapism from the Marx Brothers. Maybe so. The film didn't do as well as Horse Feathers a year earlier, but it still ended up one of the bigger box office draws of the year. All these years later, Duck Soup is generally regarded as their best film, and one of the films of 1933 that's still regularly viewed today. On November 24th, we got Joan Crawford and Clark Gable in the musical comedy Dancing Lady. Released on December 22nd was Son of Kong, an extremely quick follow-up to the hit King Kong, which had been released released only nine months earlier. It was a rush job and it showed. Kong's son is mostly played for laughs before an earthquake sinks the entire island into the sea, pretty much closing off the chance for any more sequels. The movie runs only slightly over an hour, which is short even by 1933 standards, and the special effects were pretty much limited to the last 20 minutes or so. I suppose they wanted to get something out in time for the holidays and hoped families would line up to see it. There were three big releases on December 29th. Eddie Cantor was back in another big hit comedy, Roman Scandals. There was the musical Flying Down to Rio, which paired dancers Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers together for the first, but not the last, time. And Laurel and Hardy in Sons of the Desert, a feature that played more like several shorts run together. It was another popular comedy from the duo and a solid hit. And because Prohibition had been repealed just over three weeks earlier, Stan and Ollie could be shown legal enjoying a bottle of champagne at their convention. There were also some notable movie serials playing in the second half of the year. Beginning on August 11th was Tarzan the Fearless, starring 1932 gold medal winning Olympic swimmer Buster Crab in the title role, and Jacqueline Wells as the Jane character, here for some reason named Mary. And starting on August 20th, The Perils of Pauline, starring Evelyn Knapp in the title role. It was an updated and sound remake of the popular 1914 serial. And in short subjects, on July 17th, a Betty Boop cartoon titled Popeye the Sailor introduces the cast of Popeye to animation and launches a popular new series of cartoons. An additional five Popeye the Sailor cartoons will be released before the end of the year. In the two fall Our Gang comedies, Hal Roach Studios experimented with giving Spanky on-screen parents. In Bedtime Worries, released on September 9th, and Wild Poses, released on October October 28th, Spanky played opposite his parents, Gay Seabrook and Emerson Tracy, who were sort of a Burns and Allen knockoff. They really weren't bad, but it seems it was decided that adults weren't really what our gang was about, and Seabrook and Tracy were dropped from the series. Wild Poses also features a quick cameo from Laurel and Hardy. In addition to their feature, there were three new shorts from Laurel and Hardy. Released on August 3rd was The Midnight Patrol with Stan and Ollie as policemen. On October 7th came Busy Bodies with Stan and Ollie in a workshop. It ends with one of their most remembered sight gags, an automobile being driven through a saw. And released on November 25th was Dirty Work with Stan and Ollie as chimney sweeps. Also released on October 25th was Mert and Marge based on the hit radio series. It starred Myrtle Vale, Donna Demerol, and featured Ted Healy and his Stooges. It'll turn out to be one of their last appearances together. The three Stooges will break from Healy early in 1934 and try their luck as a trio. On December 31st, 1933, with Prohibition now fully repealed, New Year's Eve revelers could legally propose a toast to much-hoped-for prosperity in the new year. 
As I feared, we've run long, so let me just say thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this, and please join us next week for some Beach Boy content. Bye.